So you must understand that the sanctity of what marriage represents must be preserved. Aqdun nikah is, is bigger than just merely what people have said. When you receive, and, and the people that do the nikah need to take it more seriously, some of them. If you look at some of the aqdun nikah, when they give you uh, the actual aqad, the actual paper, I, I would say, subhanAllah, some of the magazine articles where you can get a, a free rebate on shoes, they look nicer than those. This is aqdun nikah, this is holy, this is something sanctified. That should be something noble and beautiful, where they put it inside of a frame, where they put it somewhere. It should look beautiful. It should look noble, it should look righteous. When Allah has blessed me to conduct nikahs, everyone knows because they look, they look like an akta nikah. It looks holy, it looks sanctified, it looks righteous, it looks dignified. That's how a nikah is supposed to look. That's how it should look. So when you're looking at these ayat, someone's thinking, well, that doesn't seem fair and there might be some nice people that are idol worshippers. It's nothing to do with that. This is to do with Allah's holiness. And that must be kept. So look at it again before we move on. Allah has made it haram. Contracting a nikah with idol worshipping women. Sacramentally or physically in sexual intercourse. That's a, that's a direct general pronouncement. You don't put the exception up as the rule. And say, alhamdulillah, put your hand on the stove. It doesn't get burned. That's not the rule. That's the exception. The, the rule is you tell them, don't stick your hand on the stove. Why? Because it'll get burned off. You don't tell them, no, stick your hand on the stove. It won't get burned. No, that's the exception. The exception does not become the rule. Imam al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he then brings us to the point, and he's going to go into further depth regarding this matter. He says, quote, The scholars differ regarding, regarding the matter of that which is abrogated and that which is abrogating in this ayah. Those that would say that the idol worshippers mentioned in this ayah are those who worship idols outrightly. They would say that this statement is referring to the fact that Jews and Christians do not fall under the ruling in this, sp this specific ayah as idol worshippers with Allah. They deny the prophethood of our Prophet wasallam, And so this is not referring to them in a total sense. Our Shaykh has said this statement is completely invalid from two standpoints. Close quote. When he says our Sheikh, this is Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani. He says our Sheikh says this statement is invalid to make that statement. It's invalid. So Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, rahimahullah, Imam Josie quotes him as saying, quote, Our Sheikh has said this statement is invalid from two points. One is the reality of shirk is present and established in Jews, or Christ, in Jews and Christians when they say, for example, the Jews, Uzair is the son of Allah. Or the Christians when they say the Messiah is the son of Allah. Number two, their kufr and disbelief in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam necessitates that they would say that whatever he's come with is not from Allah. And attributing Allah's speech to other than Allah is shirk. As far as those that say that it is general and all the idol worshippers, without exception, then there are two points that have to be understood. One is that some of the rulings in the ayah is abrogated by the statement from Allah where he says وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبَلِكُمْ And those chaste women from those who were given the book 
from before you. Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayah six. But the ruling, the full impact of the ruling for those who are not people of the book remains firmly established. But secondly, you also must understand the ruling has not been abrogated, but the generality of the ruling. It's still general in all the idol worshiping women. So, just because it is permitted in a certain context to marry an idol worshiping or unbelieving woman, this, is, this proof is specific and not general. So the general ayah still remains in place. This ayah is specified and clarifies the other general ayat. And this is the position of all the fuqaha. It's also been stated by others that, for example, Uthman, Talha, Hudayfa, Jabir and Ibn Abbas, they further state this, state this matter and clarify it. When Allah said, and don't marry the idol-worshipping men, it means that you are not to marry them to a Muslim woman until they believe. So the force of this ayah is the same as the ayah before it. Close quote. Now what this is just referring to is what this is referring to is there's there was a discussion about the ulama on whether the hukum was abrogated or whether the ayah was made specific the particular ayah in surah al-maida the fifth surah ayah 6 whether the ayah was abrogated the, the the general hukum or whether it was the case that rather Allah clarified the hukum and what Imam Jawzi rahimahullah is saying is that the ulama say that Allah clarified the ruling. It's not that the hukum was abrogated because it still remains in place. We saw it in the time of the Prophet where you had one of the great scholars, Al-Hasan al-Basri, he was, and he himself came home when he was a young boy as a Muslim and told his parents, your religion is false, you must become Muslim. His family was Christian, but they became Muslim. Al-Hasan al-Basri said, it doesn't please me that I, that I, he said, it doesn't please me and it is not right that I or any other man should have, a, should have a woman as his wife who says that a prophet is Allah or the son of Allah. So that's showing you the understanding. And that's the top student of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al-Hasan al-Basri. That's showing you that that hukum was still in place even in that time. Now what's happened is, People have forgotten the rulings about uh, marriage and daughter kufr and the what who is ahl al kitab who's not who the people are that are ahl al kitab they've completely forgotten the conditions of ahl al kitab so it's something that needs to be stressed Imam al Jawzi rahimahullah he then says quote and so when we look at the words of the exalted one. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيضِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذَنْ فَاعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيضِ وَلَا تَقْرَبُوهُنَّ حَتَّى يَتْهُرْنَا فَإِذَا تَطَهَّرْنَا فَأْتُوهُنَّ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَمَرَكُمُ اللَّهِ إن الله يحب التوابين ويحب المتطهرين نساؤكم حرث لكم فأتوا حرثكم أن شئتم وقدموا لأنفسكم واتقوا الله وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ مُلَاقُوهُ وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They ask you regarding the monthly cycle. Say, it is a harm. 
Stay aloof from women during the monthly cycle. Do not approach them until they are purified. When they have purified themselves, then approach them however Allah has commanded you. Indeed, Allah, He loves those who are repentant and those who purify themselves. Your women are a tilth for you. Approach your tilth however it may be that you will and send something forward for yourselves. Fear Allah and know that you shall meet him one day and give glad tidings to the believers. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat 222-223. They ask you about the monthly cycle. It was related from Thabit from Anas who said, the children of Israel when one of their women used to have a monthly cycle from among them. They did not eat with her, nor did they drink with her, nor did they gather in the same place with her in the, in the homes. The Prophet wasallam was asked about that, and this ayah was sent down. The Prophet wasallam ordered them that they should eat with their women and drink with them, and they should be with them in their homes and that they should do everything with them except sexual intercourse. This is collected by Imam Ahmed as Musnad and Muslim in his Sahih. Ibn Abbas has said, a man came in which his name was Ibn al-Dahdaha Ibn and he was from the Ansar and he came to the Prophet and he asked, how shall we be with the women when they have their monthly cycle? And this ayah was sent down. Now the monthly cycle, why is it called the Mahid? One reason is because it is the name of the thing that is happening itself. And secondly, it is the name of the place from which the monthly cycle is coming out of. And this has been mentioned by al qadi Abu Ya'la that it is the direct statement of Imam Ahmed. So the description being given in the ayah of a harm is that the monthly cycle, the mahid, is what is being described with the harm. Not that the place is a harm or dirty, but that what is coming out is a harm and dirty. Those who've stated a second position also say that the Mahid is a reference to the place and the wording in Arabic, just like when someone says Aqiq, it's the name of the place where something is done, the place where a slaughtering is done, whereas Mahid is the name of the place where the monthly cycle comes out from. Now the harm here mentioned is that the harm that would result from having sexual intercourse with one's wife on her monthly cycle that he should mix his fluids with hers which at the time the blood coming out is najasa and there was a strong smell that comes with it and that having sexual intercourse with the woman that's menstruating is sometimes a cause for illnesses later on based upon what doctors have mentioned. Close quote. Now remember, this is 900 years ago, Baghdad. Streetlights, 70 hospitals in Baghdad. There's nothing out here. Here is nothing but trees and grass and donkeys. This is the pomp and glitter of the Muslim world. 